Um, so wait, we have, I think, some more rallying to happen here. You ready, Norm? Norm is the picker-upper in between. Okay. But she's so inspiring. Okay. Our, our next speaker who flew in from LA as well, it's his first public speech. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this reception. I'm a graduating Fairfax student, a graduating senior at Fairfax High School in Los Angeles. And I'm a high school volunteer with the Korean Resource Center. I am here tonight to give you a testimony of my life as a dreamer and undocumented person. I came here to the United States in 1998. It was my mother's courageous decision to come. My father was an abusive drunk and she had no choice but to escape with us. My mother is my hero and my role model because she sacrificed herself and everything to make sure that we have a better life. Due to the extreme circum uh, circumstances, my mother was unable to get legal status. Without status, our family always lived in fear. My mother's fear of being deported became real one night when I was just 10 years old. She had to work at night and my sister and I were looked by, we looked over by a babysitter. That night, our babysitter disappeared in the middle of the night. My sister had a nightmare and woke up crying. And I couldn't get her to stop crying no matter how hard I tried. She cried and cried. Neighbors called the law enforcement. Me, my mom, and my sister were taken, into, taken to the police station. Even though I was young, I, was, I felt scared and nervous. I did not want to be deported from the only country that I knew. Thankfully, we were all able to come out safely. I felt that it was a miracle. In my junior year in high school, I learned that I was undocumented and that I was different. I couldn't get a job, drive, and felt that I could not go to college. I lost hope. I started slacking off on school. I gave up on everything. At first, I felt nervous to tell my friends, but thanks to people at the Korea Resource Center, and with the help of my friends, I am able to stand here tonight, not afraid or lost, but hopeful of the future. I have now obtained my DACA. I am able to work. I can now get my driver's license. I have recently graduated from my high school, and I am planning to go to a community college and study hard. However, <laughs> however, what about the people who do not qualify for DACA? People like my mother. People who have aged out but want to work hard and give back. It is important to remember that immigrants give back more than we take away. This story I just said is not my, only my story, but it's the story of thousands and thousands of dreamers and millions of immigrant families. This is why we need immigration reform. Yeah. We are dealing with hundreds of thousands of millions of aspiring citizens. We are dealing with people who want to give back to the to this great country. Yeah. I ask you all to with families tomorrow at our rally. I ask you to stand with us and support us. Thank you. tomorrow at noon for David and all the others that are coming. And, uh, I think we have, we have one more speaker, Linda Cohen. Linda.
take the back seat and have her share our story. And she's a lot prettier than me as well, so <laughs> we'll, we'll have to deal with them. I know it's here as the troopers I have here. But it looks like we're talking about family here. And, and that's the basis of why we're all here today. And now, my sister, I've known her for a very long time. <laughs> And, you know, there's a saying that if you live with knowing one true friend, you live a good life. And I've been very fortunate that that's been my friend. Um, through me growing up being gay, she was my greatest supporter. She even tried to share with my parents, say, hey, you know, it's no big deal, she's just gay, right? <laughs> now, lonnie has been going through a very serious issue for years. Yet she continues to put a smile on her face. Um, when she was 19, she ended up making a mistake. And unfortunately, that mistake is changing the entirety of her life. And as a sister, watching her go through this turmoil, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's a sister of mine. I mean, when I wake up in America, I see my sister. The difference between us is a year and a half, yet she was born in a refugee camp. And when my parents arrived here, they ended up having me, luckily, right? But I'm a citizen and she's not. And because of that reason, because she's not a citizen, they are trying to deport her out of the country. Because that's okay. Because that's the law. That's what really is. I remember clearly the day when they picked her up the second time after she already completed her, her time. And I remember when we sat in court and they put her behind a monitor and the judge was getting ready to read the sentence. And you know, here we are, my parents, me and my brother, and just sitting there praying that, you know, maybe there's a chance that something good can come out of this. And the judge basically said, final order of people. That's your sentence. So, <laughs> I'm about to lose my sister. That's exactly what I felt. I'm about to lose my sister a second time because of something she did when she was 19. So, Fortunately, eight months later, as they, she was in, in prison for another eight months, basically, until I saw her again. And she finally got out, and they put her under this uh, supervision program with ICE. And we tried to live a normal life, which it was, it was pretty normal, right? You had a little skeleton in the closet, but hey, you know what? You were, you know, she was working, she was doing amazing, she was going to school, and you know, years, Passed by a good amount of years, like six, seven, eight years. So I'm, and I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe they just kind of forgot about her. Maybe, maybe this is not going to happen. Maybe with all the prayers, you know, God's finally answered and we're going to stick around. But next, uh, last year, when things were starting to go really well, they decided that maybe we need to put an anchor basin on her to get her out of the country. So, she met with ICE and they sat her down and told her that she's going to be a part of a different program. And the program was slapping an anchor based on her. So imagine seeing your own sibling, you know, whether it's a sibling or a family member, walking around with this fat anchor bracelet, just the shame of what she did 12 years ago. But that's what she had to deal with. And I remember looking over at her. And every time he went out, like she would try to conceal it, but it's evident, it's a fat anchor bracelet, you can't hide it. So, we sat down and Lenny was just like, I'm, I'm tired, I don't, I don't know what to do. And we're like, well, what options do we have at this point? What options do we have at this point, right? So finally, Lenny, thank God, decided to speak up, share our story, 
And I mean, she's pretty popular around here. It seems like people know her, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it was a tough decision because, of course, you know, with Canadian cultures, being submissive was just natural. Not sharing your story was just natural. So having her to come out and share her story was probably the hardest thing because I mean, my parents were just struggling with why are you going to do this? I mean, well, think about the family, think about the relatives, what are they going to say? You know, and the way I see it though, it's like, you know, I came out of the closet and it was really hard. And for her, it's like coming out of the closet with this story that, hey, by the way, when I was 19, I had to do something. And it wasn't right, it was breaking the law. But I'm 32 now, I've changed my life, and I'm an amazing person. I completely went off the notes. I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> but I, I just want to add that there are a lot of people in the money situation. And due to the fact that judges no longer have discretion over um, making a decision on, on, on Lonnie's case, for example, or anyone in general, because they no longer have discretion, it's black and white. If you fall into this category, you're going to get out of the country. And mind you, money never stepped foot in Cambodia, but they want her out of the country. Actually, they want her out of this country to go to any country. They said, choose a country. And Lonnie chose this country. So you're sticking around, Sid. All I know is that when I first started this mission with Lonnie, I was completely selfish about it. I did it because I want my sister to stay. And then I realized the amount of people that are in her shoes that are hiding in the dark because they're scared. Well, it's time for us to stop being scared and it's time for us to start doing something about it. Yeah. So I'm going to continue as a supporter to be there for every single event because the one thing that a person will need to choose needs is continuous support. And as family, because we all know family, man, that's why we're here, right? On the evening, on a Tuesday, I'd rather be sitting in the happy hour somewhere, but we're here for family.